Good morning, I'm Jim DeFiti and welcome to Facing South Florida. The state legislative session is fast approaching and they will be dealing with plenty of important issues that will affect all of us, so it seems like a good time to get a little perspective. Joining me this morning are two key figures, State Senator Manny Diaz, a Republican who represents the Hialeah area, and Democrat State Senator Jason Pizzo, whose district includes Miami Shores. And in all disclosure, Jason is my state senator. I would love to have you be my state senator, but uh, you know, we, we, we are where we are. We can share. We can share. So I want to start with both of you. Just give me the broad outlines. We'll start with you since you're in the majority party and Democrats don't really matter as much. Uh, just kidding. Yeah. Just kidding. <laughs> give me your perspective on what you think the overarching themes of this year's session are going to be. Well, I think transportation is going to be a big issue, especially uh, for us here down south. Uh, you have the express line issue in Miami-Dade. Uh, also, education is always at the forefront. School security, um, and there's going to be there's going to be a gaming issue that's going to be discussed. Whether something happens or not, that's yet to be seen. But I think that that's uh, the, you know the compact with the tribe, or if there is something put on the ballot now that it has to be a referendum, uh, that's that's yet to be seen. Okay, Senator. Uh, I, I would agree, and, and since my colleague here sits as the chair of the Education Committee and I have two bills pending, I think one next week uh, before his committee, uh, happy to talk about education with him. <laughs> but I, uh, generally speaking, I, I agree with, with Senator Diaz um, as it relates to education and school safety, except in Miami-Dade, uh, as you know, Jim, school safety, really we're talking about student safety, and the greatest threat to many of our students is not inside the school but outside the school. All right, we're going to get to all that, but you mentioned something at the outset, so let's start there, express lanes. So you have a bill that would essentially do away with the experiment that we've had with the last seven or eight years in express lanes. Talk to me a little well, bit about it. Well, it would specifically deal with the Palmetto. We've seen that this project that was designed in 2010 and approved in 2011 within the DOT and the MPO and all that has caused more of an issue than it, than it has created a, a relief for traffic in Miami-Dade. So only on the Palmetto? Only on the Palmetto right now. So in, in theory, you're not opposed to express lanes. I'm not opposed to those express lanes. I think they do work for certain geographical locations in our population, but the problem is that the uh, ill that they've created for some, uh, the, the meat of the population is, is more than, than the relief it's provided for others. It, our, it, now that we've had several years into it, the, is, is, there, is the purpose of express lanes revenue generator or is it really designed to make traffic more, move more efficiently and do we know what's really the preponderance, what, what's really happening now that we've had it on the ground for a few years? Well, the, the, the purpose is not revenue generation but to really move traffic and for people that are traveling longer distances. So if you're coming from the very north part of the county and you're going down south, they do work. The problem is that they've created more traffic in let's call them the regular lanes and, and they do work work when you have capacity. For example, if you look at I-75 and the portion that is in, in Miami, Dana, Broward, they work well. But why does that happen? Because there was so much space to begin with. The Palmetto was already uh, crowded and narrow, and then we tried to put express lanes on there, and it's just not working. There's, there's an issue with design. There's also an issue with uh, where folks have access to get on the express lane. Your thoughts? Uh, I'm going to go back a, a little further. I'd like to just get a lot of people out of their cars. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, I was a prosecutor years ago when we had these misdemeanor traffic cases, and we have hundreds of thousands of uninsured motorists on the roadway. We don't inspect cars. Okay, it's on the way here to the studio. I can get into a brand new something for $129 a month, compra key, paga key. It's too easy to get on the roadway. In undergrad, when I was at NYU, I wrote a subway system that started in 1904 with everybody. Uh, black, brown, white, rich, poor, and that's how we moved people. The issue is that we're not fostering the idea of creating a critical mass of people that want to get in and advocate for things like the smart plan and rail and, and, and mass transit. We need to get people off the roadway uh, and, and make it attractive to do so. We just don't have that critical mass. As it relates to the express lanes, uh, I use them. I take them if I'm at the southern part of my district, which goes as far south as, uh, as 836, all the way up to what I'm getting off to go home and 163rd, I use them. Uh, and do I think that they're effective? I think they've bottlenecked those that are not using it uh, to, to some extent. And I just don't know that just increasing capacity or increase, increasing width of roadways or, or, or bringing those lanes back gets to the heart of the issue, which you know, we have nearly 3 million people in this county, and you and me and Senator Diaz 
use our own cars to get here today. Well, yeah, you, I'm going to go to a spinoff. I had this later, but I wanted to sort of raise it now that you sort of touched on who's on our roadways. I, I know that there is a, an effort to try to move towards providing driver's licenses for undocumented residents. That there's about 750,000 people who live in the state of Florida who do not have access to driver's licenses. There's a study that actually just came out from the Florida Policy Institute that said it would not only generate $68 million a year in revenue if you were to do that, but it would also make the roads safer in that you have a lot of hit and run accidents where drivers leave the scene because they don't have a driver's license. I know that Senator Simmons is, is advocating for a bill like this. Senator Diaz, I'm just curious, your thoughts, you probably have a fair number of undocumented folks living in your district. Should, should we be uh, allowing undocumented residents to have driver's licenses? I think the devil is in the details there, Jim, because I think when you ask that question, on the surface, it is better if people have license and they're documented in that sense. The question is, uh, what is their status of being undocumented? If we're talking about people that have criminal records or have issues that have occurred, uh, you know, then, then I think those people should not have them. And, and I know that creates another problem, but I think at some point we have to draw the line. If you're talking to people that have overstayed their visas or, you know, so I think they would, it would take some cooperation with the federal government understanding who these folks are. And if they're trying to get their work visa back or they're trying to do the right thing, then I think having a license would be helpful. Uh, I don't think that solves all of our problems. As you know, South Florida is infamous for having these these issues, whether they have a license or not, uh, we I have plenty of bad drivers. On the road, issues, right, yes. bad drivers. So, so I think that that could be scratching the surface. Uh, and I'm interested in, in hearing more of the details from Senator Simmons. Why, why not allow it? I mean, it, it really, if we don't have car inspections, so we're really not being able to have a captive audience to vet whether or not the car is even suitable, the auto is suitable for the environment, or, or, or operationally, mechanically. We don't get to check people's registration. People will sometimes fake uh, an insurance card because they got it for the one day and one off. But why not? You don't need, need to be an actuary to know that if everybody feels safer to be on the roadways, uh, has documentation to drive. This doesn't speak to immigration status. It speaks to being on the roadway. It'll foster and encourage people to be properly insured, properly registered. And again, I go back to it. When I handled misdemeanor traffic cases, if, if you did a hit and run and took off, as opposed to just staying there and apologizing, even in the worst circumstances where death resulted, if you hung around and didn't have the malice to take off for, for some other reason, you were treated a lot better. You know your caucus pretty well. What do you think the chances of something like this, this passing through uh, this year? Senator Simmons is obviously Senate pro tem, you know, so he carries a little bit of weight. But do you see this as, as something that's likely to gain any traction? The Democrats tried it, I think, in the last session. It didn't go anywhere. Yeah, and, and this is something we've seen before. When I was in the House, I think we saw that, that same bill, and I believe it was vetoed by the governor. So I think that, there, that there's going to be a split in the caucus. I think there are some folks that uh, look at it from a practical perspective and think if there's a way to do this right, to make sure that those people that, were, that are trying to get along and get their business done and do the right thing, um, then, then they'll be for it. I think there's going to be some members that are going to be vehemently against it. I, I want to, we got about three minutes in this segment, so I want to talk about uh, school safety, student safety, and then we'll, because we'll, we'll, I want to save a lot of time for talk about education in the next sure. block. But with regard to school safety, I know that, uh, that Tom Lee, the Senate president, appointed, um, no, actually, uh, Tom Lee was appointed by the Senate right. president to examine whether or not there needs to be further laws enacted as are related to student safety and guns. Um, do we know what the status of what he's recommending out? Uh, do we know what, what's likely to come before the Senate this year? So, you know, uh, Senator Lee had a hearing and started to take in information. I, our committee has actually had the, uh, the, the ability to listen to a lot of this over the last year because we dealt with the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Commission report and, and when I was in the House, you know, we dealt with uh, 7026. So I think that w what happens is this, is this is something that's ever evolving. You know, we're going to find out, we're going to get feedback from superintendents, from school boards, from, from personnel on the ground, from sheriff's offices on what worked and what didn't work and what hole there is now and what we have to figure out. So is, I think is an assault weapon ban a non-starter in the Florida legislature? I think it's a non-starter. Jason, I'm just curious your thoughts. Where do you see us going? Where should we be going? Jim, I, I'm selfish uh, for my district, uh, both on my professional past and, and just personal feeling. And what I mean by that is uh, I, I do philosophically uh, support background checks and, and closing loopholes and, and so forth. But I'm selfishly concerned about the kids that, that live in my district on the west side and the east side, north and south. What do I mean by that? I mean the overwhelming amounts of shootings and homicides resulting from handguns and easy and readily access. And 15 and 16 year olds don't go to gun shows. And 15 and 16 year olds don't 
have background checks. What do they have? They have ready access uh, to handguns, and we're losing so many kids. Uh, you see it in the headlines of someone shooting so and so and so and so. The the thing I can't reconcile, and one of the bills I've actually filed, and, and Senator Diaz is one of his committees may see it, is to allow for the unlawful possession of a firearm, which is already in statutes, in Florida Statute 790.22. That which is unlawful for a minor to be in possession, there are exceptions, whether you're hunting or whether you're target shooting. But if you're a 15 year old on Facebook with a firearm, racking it, loading it, so on and so forth, which precipitates just about every shooting I ever had. It's some beef that goes back and forth. Here's the discrepancy. If a kid up in, uh, in a suburban area says, I'm going to shoot somebody, SWAT will be at their house in 15 minutes. But we have kids who go on social media and actually show the firearm, show the instrument. A picture, to me, is worth a thousand words. Does this become a free speech issue? And it's not a free speech issue. I'll tell you why. About 95% of our kids lose their First Amendment right the, the day they're born now because we blast them all over the place. Parents have the right to abridge your, your, your First Amendment right. Um, and conversely, they're able to expose it. So it's not a First Amendment right because a 15-year-old in possession of a firearm let's say in a movie theater, in a school, in a park, doesn't have a Second Amendment right to hold it, and doesn't have a First Amendment right, that's not a protection society's prepared to recognize that an unlawful act simply by being placed on social media is somehow sterilized from the unlawful activity it is. All right, I want to get your response to that, but I got to take a break here, and then we're going to turn to education, because that's a big topic a lot of people are concerned about. We'll be right back.